Polly Higgins is known as the lawyer for the earth. She's a barrister, an international lawyer, and the award-winning author of Eradicating Ecocide and other works. Ecocide is damage, destruction, or loss of ecosystems such that peaceful enjoyment of a territory by the inhabitants is severely diminished or lost. And that includes all the inhabitants, not just the human ones. Polly Higgins is out to make Ecocide a new UN-recognized crime against peace, just like crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. She calls these UN international laws super laws that supersede everything else so that all other laws must conform to them. Ecocide clearly is, she argues, not only a crime against peace, but also a crime against humanity, against nature, and against future generations. An international ecocide law would trump the national laws that give the highest priority to profit and would substitute an overriding duty of care for people and the planet. She proposed such a law to the UN in 2010, and she's been organizing support for it ever since. No small ambition, but I wouldn't bet against the strength and passion of Polly Higgins. Thank you very much for doing this. And, but let me say, it's a pleasure to meet someone who's described as one of the top unreasonable people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Who called you that and why? Well, that, that, that really is my greatest accolade. I, I can't remember. It, it's an American magazine, some big American magazine a few years ago. I, and they listed me as one of their top ten un, most unreasonable people. But for me, that, that really spoke to me because reasonable people just do, do what is. You've got to be reasonable. This is the way things are. But the problem is, if you remain reasonable, you remain complicit in an existing system. And if that existing system is causing harm, then it's not about whether or not you're reasonable. In fact, if anything, it's about standing up and saying, no, I refuse to remain reasonable about this. I refuse to remain complicit in a system of harm. So it, it, for me, this really does speak very loudly. Uh, there is a wonderful TED talk somewhere about how if the world is going to change, all it requires are a few un fundamentally unreasonable people because they refuse to accept the existing normative. And that's precisely what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a way, that's your dare to be great, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It is, in a you way. You can't be reasonable and be great. Maybe that's the implication. Precisely, precisely. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You've you got to rock the boat sometimes. You've got to disrupt the system uh, to effect greater change. Yeah. And you're trying to, up, to upend the system in a very serious way with the yes. calling for a law of ecocide, and particularly calling for a law of ecocide that would supersede the obligation of corporations to make profits. Yes, that's right. I'm not anti-profit. I, what I am doing is I'm addressing profit that causes significant harm. So what a law of ecocide does is it creates a legal duty of care to put the health and well-being, if you like, of people and planet first. So that's an overriding legal duty. That comes first, and then profit can flow from that. And so what it does is it restricts, and in fact it prohibits, dangerous industrial activity, but it enables industrial activity within a corporate context to move into innovation of a different kind, uh, based on a first do-no-harm principle. So actually it's very exciting. Laws restrict and they enable. So by restricting or prohibiting on one side, you're enabling uh, innovation in another way to evolve. And this is very important, especially when we're looking at corporate-driven ecocide, uh, human-caused ecocide on a major scale. It's about uh, changing the decision-making in the boardroom at the very top end. Uh, the principles known in international criminal law as the principle of superior responsibility. So those who are at the very top end, the decision-makers, then have to fundamentally change the questions they ask themselves. And rather than asking the question, how do we maximise our profit out of this energy company, they're asking, first of all, is this going to uh, ensure that uh, we do no harm? And then what happens is you make very different decisions about where your energy is being sourced from. And that creates uh, a very dynamic energy in a very different direction quite literally as well as metaphorically. So in a sense, you don't even really get to make the business decision until you're satisfied that you're uh, within that, that uh, limitation. And in one way, yes, it's a limitation, but in another way, it's an enabler. 
because if you really want to go beyond petroleum today, it's actually almost impossible because at the moment uh, you're stuck in a legal framework that says that you have to put the interests of the shareholders first, which is to maximise profit. So of course it becomes a huge hindrance that you have to deal with uh, uh, environmental issues that, that uh, fundamentally undermines your profit margins. But if you start with an overriding legal duty of care that puts the health and well-being, the interests of people and planet first, then it frees you up uh, to make fundamentally very different decisions at, the, at boardroom level. It's a bizarre thing when you think about it, that shareholders should have come to outrank everything else on the planet. Yeah. I, well, you know, in a way what happens is we put in place laws uh, as we evolve over time. And one of, one of the um, fundamental flaws, if you like, that we have actually dates back to a case in, I think, 1886 in America, the Santa Clara case. And that was a case where it was decided uh, the 14th Amendment had just been put in place and the recognition of rights of slaves. Uh, and it was announced at the beginning of the case without any legal determination that in fact companies have the same rights as uh, blacks do. So it was the first time ever that uh, a company, a fictional legal person who'd had the same rights as natural human beings. Problem is, is that a company uh, is actually just a piece of paper. And by granting rights to a piece of paper, it, it has created a huge amount of problems because uh, uh, the fictional person who does not have the same duties and obligations, human beings carry duties and obligations, but ultimately at the end of the day, if a company does wrong, at the moment all you can do is sue the company, the fictional personhood, and there's no point putting a piece of paper in prison. All you can do is leverage a fine and the company can continue as normal. So this is really a fundamental flawed imbalance. It's created a huge imbalance in justice in its own right. You can say the scales of justice are out of kilter here because it's the absolution of uh, responsibilities within the corporate uh, entity. So in a way what I'm doing with international criminal law is putting back those responsibilities. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, one, I'm in favor of the death penalty for companies because it seems to me that is one thing we could do that for some reason we don't. If the, if the offense is sufficiently egregious, you could dissolve the company. Yeah. Right? Well, actually under criminal law what happens is because you're levering, leveraging uh, a crime against a person, so that would be a CEO or a director, the court also then has powers to close down the company as well because you, it's, it's dealing with prohibition. When, when something is a, a crime, then you are empowered and enabled to actually stop precisely what's happening. Under civil litigation, you can't do that. All you can do is leverage a fine, and business can continue as usual. I, I call civil litigation catch-me-if-you-can laws, because often a company has to can litigate for many years, can throw a lot of money at it, can settle it and can still move on with business as usual. But criminal law is about prohibition. It's about prevention as well. And it's about preemption. It's about stopping something before it escalates. And that's very important. And your, your view of this would also pierce the corporate veil. So instead of saying it's the company that's responsible, you're saying, no, no, there are people within the company making these decisions and they need to take responsibility, not slough it off on the that's company. That's exactly right. Piercing the corporate veil is absolutely crucial here so that there is no hiding behind that. It, it's about dealing with individual responsibility at the very top end, yeah, mm -hmm. and holding those individuals to account. And that, that actually acts as a very powerful lever if you're sitting on uh, a board of directors and you think that company is about to uh, commit ecocide or contribute to ecocide. You as an individual, you have responsibility for that decision making. And what you'll find is uh, many CEOs and directors will say, I don't want to go there. That's a crime. We, we don't want to be in that business because after all, actually, we're unlikely to get the permit uh, for what we want to do. Uh, our shareholders would find it untenable uh, and uh, investment will no longer flow to this and actually that will damage our bottom line in, in any event. And, and but also, if we go ahead and do this and I am directly responsible, I will face personally the consequences and, and that also is a real <laughs> incentive not huge, to do it. Huge, eh? absolutely. Yeah. 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 
So let's go back for a moment to, to, to talk about what ecocide actually is, because when I first heard the word, I took it to mean the, you know, the overall decline of the planet okay, that, that we were going through, in a sense, almost like an extinction, that ecocide equals uh, a harm that broad. But your sense of it is that it's more, or your use of the term is more constrained than that and more condensed in a way than that. Well, what it's doing is giving practical application and a legal definition to the word ecocide. So I have defined ecocide in law as extensive damage, destruction to or loss of ecosystems of a given territory. And there are two types of ecocide here. There's human-caused ecocide, which is largely corporate ecocide. You can identify mass damage and destruction and say that is an ecocide caused by I, that particular industry's activities, which has been caused by decision making uh, by individuals at the very top end. And you can identify who those people are who are responsible for uh, what has played out. There's also a second type of ecocide, which is equally as important, and that's naturally occurring ecocide rising sea levels, tsunamis, typhoons, uh, floods. I, uh, this is very important. W what happens there is actually about creating a legal duty of care to give assistance to stop, uh, first of all, the dangerous industrial activity that is helping uh, trigger, if you like, the unnatural, uh, uh, well, the naturally occurring ecocides. So, uh, but it's twofold. You could say it's climate crime, if you like. The, the criminality lies in those states who are allowing those companies to continue with their dangerous industrial activity that contributes and triggers climate change. But the second side of it is the creation of the legal duty of care to make it mandatory for other states to give assistance to those who are adversely impacted by climate change. And that's very, very important, especially within the context of the failure of climate negotiations to even begin to address this. Uh, for instance, in the climate negotiations, there was a lifeline for small island developing states and other countries that are looking at um, catastrophic events such as rising sea levels and, and so on and so forth. And that lifeline was called the Climate Displacement Coordination Facility. Well, that was cut just weeks before we're about to start with the climate negotiations. And this is despite the fact that a quarter of the world's countries require this key mechanism, it's their lifeline, and it's been cut out of the text. Essentially what the Climate Displacement Coordination Facility means is migration with dignity, where your properties and land have been washed away uh, through some catastrophe. So with that being removed, where do you turn? I, and what I'm proposing with ecocide law is, is another way by simply calling for climate crime, hello, <laughs> by calling for climate crime, uh, then an amendment can be made to the Rome Statute to put in place a crime of ecocide so that it has that twofold mechanism. It then places a duty on the states to close down the dangerous industrial activity that's triggering climate change and it creates the legal duty of care to give assistance in times of emergency. So it's an orderly way for a state whose territory is disappearing yes. and for its people to move on to whatever there may be next. And the important thing here is, is that it becomes a mandatory duty, an overriding duty at the very top end. There is a hierarchy of law, if you like, and international criminal law uh, sits at the very top. Uh, so you cannot override international criminal law with bilateral treaties, for instance. I, and what I'm proposing through an amendment to the Rome Statute is very simple. It's a fast track, if you will, where we're not having to create a whole new treaty or agreement or so on and so forth. In fact, we're putting in place something that has legal teeth at the very top end. And that's absolutely necessary, especially when you're dealing with something like the climate negotiations, where there is no enforcement mechanism to ensure that what is absolutely required in times of emergency is given that, that, that legal weight. And in fact, the mechanism that's required has been removed in any event. So it's left it completely toothless. Yeah. Now let, let, let me again go back a little bit. And this, uh, the Statute of Rome is really a treaty more than a statute. It's not a statute of a parliament. It's a 
No. It's a treaty arrangement. Right? Uh, n okay, you've got two, two things at play here. You have the Rome Treaty, it's a completely different document, and you have the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute uh, originally was called the Code uh, of Offences Most Serious to Humankind, the, the, the International Crimes Against Peace. Uh, the Rome Statute is a codification document and it happened to be signed off in Rome in the end. I, what it, it does is it codifies the existing international crimes against peace, that's genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity, and it makes provision for new international crimes against peace to be added to it. So crimes of aggression was tabled uh, for amendment in 2010. And what I'm saying is that now there's another tabling for an amendment required here for ecocide to be added uh, alongside genocide and, and the other international crimes. It also sets in place the International Criminal Court, which sits in The Hague here in the Netherlands. I, and it, it, the important thing really with this document is that to have an amendment put in place, all it requires is for one signatory state to call for that amendment and then it uses the normal United Nations process where it's signed off after you have two-thirds majority of signatory states. It's one vote per signatory state, unlike the climate negotiations where you have huge power imbalances. For instance, I was in Bonn for the interim climate, climate negotiations, talking to negotiators there, and um, what I saw was uh, a system where there were over 700 negotiators from America but for the small island developing states, where there are 54 of them, some of the negotiators were doubling up. Some of them were even representing five states. And when you have 32 working group meetings running in tandem, and you've got one person representing five countries, you have real difficulty in deciding which meeting you're going to go to and trying to cover the others. Meanwhile, other countries can send in dozens of negotiators to each meeting. And ultimately what happens there is that key items get cut from the text, as has happened with the Climate Displacement Coordination Facility. So this is really problematical. It's, it's basically it's a power struggle. It's a huge imbalance in a very big way. I, but the avenue I'm proposing doesn't work on that system. The climate negotiations works on a very unusual system. It's, it's not the normal system. And so what I'm saying is that there is a, a just system that can be applied here by using the normal way through the United Nations, by getting an amendment to the Rome Statute. You can call for that and, and then when it's tabled, it's just simply uh, an addition of signatories. It, it doesn't, it's not a be all or end all vote in one day as we have with climate negotiations. You have to get something sorted by the end of the two weeks in Paris. It doesn't work like that. Once it's open for signatories, it remains open and you just simply accrue those signatories over time. And in a sense, it's, it's, um, uh, it's not exactly non-political, but it's not political in the sense of a whole bunch of people getting together, voting, lobbying, etc., etc. It's a very precise legal process. Absolutely right, right yes. Yeah. So. And that actually brings us to why, why we're, we're pursuing what we have been, because we've seen a number of cases, uh, we being the Green Interview team, um, <coughs> where legal processes have been found that have, in a sense, compensated for the failure of democratic processes to actually reach conclusions. Right? In a way, what, what's happening here is where political will fails, then the rule of law prevails. And we get to a certain point where we recognize that we have to turn to the rule of law. What is also very interesting here is that e ecocide law is about state crime and corporate crime, really. I, and this is very important here because especially when you have 31 countries I, having their oil interests under state ownership, and the refusal of those countries to abate their dangerous industrial activity, then ecocide law becomes a very powerful law to ensure that the state adheres to international crime. Uh, suddenly, ministers and heads of states become accountable in uh, an international criminal court of last resort. So that's, that's really about check and balance of political will as well. Now tell me how this works in practice. If we have the ecocide law and, and I am running a small oil-rich state of some kind, mm -hmm. 
and and essentially the the law says cease and desist. Right? You you can't be going on this way. You're, and I say, make me. Yeah. What happens now? Well, imagine this. You aren't even signed up to the Rome Statute, so you're you're not a signatory. I. Uh, so we can't touch you if you continue with your operations within your own country, but as soon as you step out of that country, uh, action can be taken. If you step into a signatory state, then you can be prosecuted. Uh, I'll give you an example of precedent when we've done this before. So back in 1998, uh, General Pinochet came to my country in the UK. Uh, in fact, he was there to see his doctor. He wasn't well. And a Spanish uh, prosecutor came over and indicted him on the spot for crimes against humanity. Balthasar Garcon was the Spanish prosecutor. What happened there was that he was indicted on crimes against humanity and he argued, his legal team argued, you can't touch us, we haven't signed up to the Rome Statute, we're not signatories, uh, therefore this doesn't apply. That went up all the way up to our House of Lords, it's now called the Supreme Court, and in a nutshell, the judgment was given saying, tough, yes it does. The principle in law is called ergo omnes, it applies to all, and if you step into a signatory state, we are perfectly entitled to prosecute you for this. Now, the International Criminal Court at that time was being set up, it wasn't fully operational, so he was actually given a choice. You can stay here and be prosecuted uh, in the UK, or you can go back to Chile and be prosecuted over there. I, and that's because the International Criminal Court Act is a court of last resort. It should be prosecuted on national territory first and foremost, and where a state is either unwilling or unable, then it will step in. And essentially what was happening there was the, the, the legal system within the UK was stepping in uh, and saying, you can be prosecuted here on our territory if you don't, if you're either unwilling or able to be prosecuted in Chile. Actually, the Chilean government did prosecute him over there, or set up to prosecute him. He, in fact, he pleaded guilty two days before the court trial started, and he died. Nevertheless, it doesn't really matter. What, what's important here is it set precedent. We know how this can apply for future. So even if you are a state that isn't a signatory, such as America, interestingly, uh, you can be prosecuted once you step out of your own territory. So what it does is it marginalises, significantly marginalises your operations. At the moment we have 123 signatories to the Rome Statute. If you are a global player in whatever energy system um, we're talking about, or whatever business we're talking about that, uh, for purposes of ecocide, is a dangerous industrial activity, you will either become significantly marginalised in what you can and cannot do, or you will want to go with the new rules of the game, if you like, so that you can continue with business as usual and operate in a new way. Mm. So in a sense, you either have to sign up and change your ways yeah. or face the possibility of prosecution anywhere in the world anytime you leave your own country. Or just scale down your operations. But um, business, of course, always wants to grow. It doesn't necessarily want to reduce itself to a marginal player. Yeah. So choices then have to be made. Well, let me be sure I understand the, the extraterritoriality <coughs> kind of yeah. character of all this, be, because although the United States is not a signatory, yeah. and, but the, you have a credible body of opinion that argues that, the, that at least one of the past presidents of the United States is a war criminal. Yes. Does that mean that when George Bush travels, that, he's, that he could be charged with war crimes in whatever country he visits? Yes. Have I got that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, it's stepping into signatory states, yes. All it, all it requires is actually for a case to be up and ready and running and for him to step into a country. So the evidence has to be garnered. Uh, it's a bit pointless trying to indict someone if you don't have the case to back it up. So this is about having the evidence and the facts to hand. Uh, this is what Balthasar Garçon had prepared, ready and prepared with General Pinochet. Ready to go. Boom. Indict. Move fast. So he had the trap in a sense laid yes. before the quarry came anywhere near the territory. He had the case <laughs> ready to go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm being a little more colourful, yeah. but, you know, <laughs> but it's the same thing. With, yeah. So presumably, in a case, and I, I'm just pursuing this to just understand the mechanism, not you know, but um, but presumably, if one had prepared a similar case against someone like George Bush, 
and had it ready to go whenever Bush went to any signatory state. Yeah. This is something that could be, uh, he would really have no, def no, no way of avoiding. Would Absolutely it? right. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So the effect of, 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 of the ecocide law would be very powerful even in states that, that it, it would marginalize them, you know, would yes. basically make them outcasts, mm -hmm. and it would endanger the, the uh, specifically the people, not just the, the corporate entity. So it, it has huge power uh, to really change the rules of the game very, very fast. I, but it goes actually further than that because, it, in fact, it adversely impacts those countries who aren't signatories really pretty much from the outset. As soon as it's on the table for amendment, and I advocate a transition period, uh, all laws have a transition period. Uh, national laws are usually between six months and two years. Uh, European directives usually around two years. And I advocate for a five-year transition period. And what that does is it allows corporations and uh, politics to realign their priorities very fast. And more than that, what it does, it, 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 it creates long-term investment signals. So the investment world says, OK, in five years' time, this is going to be criminal activity. We no longer want to invest in this. In fact, actually, the low risk and even no risk, zero risk, is going to be the innovation in the other direction, uh, the renewable energy as opposed to the fossil fuel energy, for instance. And suddenly you'll see that the flow of money shifts very quickly. And of course, once money starts shifting in another direction, you get you know, institutes coming in, um, uh, you get skilling up, you, you get, you're building a resilient economy, you're basically creating jobs very fast, you're skilling up in a very quick, very fast way. And in truth, those countries that are not signatories will find that there's not only a brain drain, but also there's a financial drain. No longer will major investment want to go into something that is part of an old way of doing things that's actually becoming obsolete very fast. So it becomes more difficult to, to actually receive permits in countries that are moving in that direction. Uh, the finance, finance and investment, uh, lobbying of uh, countries is no longer uh, pulling the same kind of leverage because actually you have ministers turning around saying, I can't give you those permits because this is going to be a crime in so many years' time, but we're more than happy to assist you if you want to move in a different direction. And moreover, shareholders. You know, we're such a globalised world. If you're a shareholder um, of a big transnational corporation and you see that the rest of the world is moving into another direction, uh, but your company is evading responsibility just by dint of where it's marginalising its operations. You're not going to want to actually put your shares in there and put your money in there either. So it changes the, the playing field overnight and it creates a level playing field for everyone to come in uh, and move in a different direction. Remember, law serves to restrict on one side but enable on another. And that's what's so important here. It, it has a dual purpose, if you like. It's quite fascinating, isn't it? Because in, in a sense, it's not the legal process, it's the knowledge that the legal, pro legal process exists. Yes. You, and you've said at one point that you would like to see this law be quite severe and quite tough and have fairly stringent penalties for individuals behind the corporate veil, yeah. but you'd also like to see no prosecution. Yeah, I mean, the success in it is actually how it moves and uh, because everything shifts in a different direction, it's, it, it ultimately is about the flow of money. It's enabling money and investment to go into the innovation in the other direction very, very fast. And corporations work very well with very clear-cut boundaries. When it's known that actually to go that way has significant consequences at a personal level, you'll find that very few people do want to undertake the dangerous industrial activity and that suddenly the problem becomes the solution. We want to go in that direction. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, a good, there's a good story to be told there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if I were your, your tough Texas oil baron, <laughs> I would probably say, now, oh, Polly, this is all very well, but, but, you know, you can't make a transition that big that fast, and fossil fuel is going to be part of our future for as far as the eye can see. What do you say to, to, to him? Well, I'd say look to your own country, how often it's happened before. So America, for instance, during the war effort, I, 
I decided that you wanted to come in very late into World War II and you wanted to scale up with airplanes. But the problem was, was that in America, the aviation industry wasn't set up for mass production. So what happened there was the likes of Henry Ford were asked, you know, here you are, you're doing mass production of cars, of automobiles. Why don't you just make them larger and make aeroplanes? And of course, Henry Ford said, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. So I'm busy pulling up uh, railway lines so that nobody uses trains and they use my cars instead. So your government, the American government, turned around, scratched its head that night, came back the very next day and said, it is now illegal for you to make cars. You are now, by law, going to have to make planes and we will make it financially worth your while. And the amazing thing was, was that over a period of just 18 months, I forget what the exact figures are, but say it, it, it was in the region of 5,000 planes were required. In fact, it wasn't the, the scaling up uh, in industry, it was the training up of uh, engineers. Huge amount of engineers were required very quickly. And usually it took five years to train engineers. So what America did was it took their, their top, their best, you know, up and coming students and uh, very bright enge uh, existing engineers and they said, okay, you're going to train them up in seven months. Now, your country didn't get 5,000 odd planes, it got tenfold, 50,000 within 18 months. That scaling up in times of emergency and that can-do mentality that has in fact created the oil industry in the first place uh, can be applied just as it was during wartime to really move very, very fast. And the enabling conditions were set as a result of the laws that were put in place. And of course, the flow of money, the investment that went into it went very quickly because this is going to be highly profitable. And what's more, it had knock-on secondary industries. You know, America was the one country after World War II that really flourished financially. It, it created a can-do mentality that exists to this very day. Mm -hmm. That is an astonishing uh, transformation yeah. when you think about it. Kind Absolutely. Of that. Yeah. 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 Let me come back again briefly to the eco side before moving forward again with the, with the question how we get from, from here to there. You've described it as being a crime against nature, yeah. uh, against human rights, yes. and against future generations. Yes. Can you tell me how it works on those three fronts? For example, on human rights, how, does it, how do you see the... Uh well, where uh, humans are put at risk of injury or harm, or worse yet, loss of lives, then uh, those states that are failing to stop the dangerous industrial activity that's triggering climate change when we're looking through the context of it being climate crime, or are failing to give assistance, can be held to account. And that's very important, and, and most particularly when it comes to prosecution, you're looking at the individuals who make the decisions. So you're looking at key ministers, you're looking at key heads of state. Uh, so this is really about uh, governance and protection, duties and obligations, to ensure and uphold the human right to life, if you will. And it, we already do that on a one-to-one -one level. You know, your human right to life is governed and protected by the crime of murder, or in America you call it homicide. I, and that's very important because what that means is your life is protected and I have a duty and obligation to ensure that I do not destroy your life. Now, that doesn't mean that we have no uh, murder happening, I, but what it does mean is that we can take action to either prevent or preempt or prohibit. So if I take your life, I can be prosecuted and my rights as a citizen are then withdrawn and I'm duly imprisoned. It serves, our, it serves a number of, uh, in a number of respects. This is about justice, uh, retribution, but it's also it's about messaging out to society that it is absolutely untenable and not just morally wrong but legally wrong to take another's life. And what it does is it serves to significantly abate it. Society at large recognises that that is, is a wrong per se. Uh, believe it or not, there was a time when it was not a crime to take another person's life. So what we're doing with Ecoside is we're dealing with collective harm at, at the very top level. This is very much about not just one human life, but many human lives being put at risk of injury or harm, or, or even loss of life. And of course, if, if your small island state is going underwater, 
and there is no lifeline and you're just uh, stuck on boats, what happens? You, know, you could be just left to die or in camps and so on and so forth. And that creates a, a legal responsibility, a duty and obligation on states to ensure that that does not happen to ensure that there is, in fact, migration with dignity, to ensure that states come together and say, OK, we need to allocate land here, we need to allocate provisions, we need to allocate assistance under trusteeship principles. So th that's how, if you like, ecocide law creates a, 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 a collective duty, a, a global commons duty, if you like, for humanity at large. Now, a crime against nature, ecocide is a crime against nature, of course, this is mass damage and destruction of, of land, of water, of um, the atmosphere, um, heavy extractive industries uh, such as unconventional oil extraction uh, you know, it is, is a dangerous industrial activity that causes significant harm, you know, ancient arboreal wetlands, peatlands and, and forests are, are destroyed, uh, and for what? A quick fix of fossil fuel and another carbon sink is, is destroyed. And crimes against future generations, well, this is really about ticking time bombs, if you will. What is it that we do here and now that may not have a significant adverse uh, or long-term uh, harm playing out until a future date? So nuclear waste, nuclear energy, uh, what are we setting up and storing up where it can go very, very wrong uh, further down the line? Or the use of, um, dare I say it, you know, genetic modification, chemi chemicals, pesticides on our land, it can play out for generations far later on. And that in itself is, uh, once we know that there are potential adverse consequences, then it is our duty and responsibility to ensure that that stops and we find better ways of addressing it. So there's an implication that had never occurred to me, which is, is that if you had ecocide as a, uh, on the books as an international crime, Presumably, you would make you would be making chemical companies like, say, Monsanto, very, very, or Bayer, or any of the other big ones. Uh, th they would be very, very careful about what they released into the environment. Right? Yeah, and, and, and Whereas absolutely. now they tend to say, well, we think it's good, and there's certainly a profit in it, and we're going to spray it over all of you know Germany or something. You have to you have to look to the consequences. So decisions then have to be made in a very different way, and I, this is very important because, of course. Uh, if a company comes along and says, actually, this is perfectly safe, fine, not a problem. If you end up being prosecuted for a crime of ecocide because it has demonstrated harm, uh, then it's up to you to um, pr disprove. The burden of proof shifts. You have to then disprove that it has caused harm. So this comes down to evidence. And it's also it's creating longer time spans. You're looking into the, the future. How does this play out? you know, maybe sometimes 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line. So this is very important. Of course, if a company is not causing harm, they have nothing to fear from ecocide law. It will help and benefit them greatly to advance and move forward with something that is non-harmful. Uh, it also allows those companies to think outside the box, be the true innovators, maybe get into a uh, more biodiverse ways of engaging uh, with uh, farming practices such as permaculture, bio, um, biodiversity programs I, such as, I'm thinking, um, biodynamics. Yeah. There's a different way of engaging with agriculture that needn't be uh, harmful. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's another huge theme that you've just touched on too though, which is that if you're dealing with things in this manner, um, it, it doesn't become a matter of PR, it doesn't become a matter of people's opinions, it doesn't become a matter of votes, it becomes a matter of evidence. Yes. And, and isn't that one of our great problems with the whole ecological thing, is that so much that goes on is not based on evidence, it's based on stuff that can be easily manipulated. Absolutely right. And this is one of the biggest problems we have, is that we don't have a proper forum to give proper assessment. And of course, a, a, a court of law, a criminal court of law, does do that. So mm -hmm. it is not a defence in criminal law to say this is good for society at large. Uh, if it causes a harm, it is a harm and it must stop. There's no such thing in criminal law as a good harm. <laughs> yeah, and we recognise that, for instance, um, beating up children. Yeah. 
I standing there and saying, well, you know, my defence is that that child needed a good beating up, so they would do as they were told. In a court of law, this is not recognised as a valid defence. Likewise, to be able to, to stand up in court and say, yes, but it's good for society that we feed them with crops that are uh, sprayed and cause illness and create enormous harm and create massive soil depletion. Uh, that, that's not a valid defence. The good harm defence does not mm. exist in criminal law. Well, of course, the goods you've just enumerated aren't goods. Really, well, precisely, right? you know? yeah. precisely. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's too narrow a view. Yeah. Yeah. It's recognised that harm can play out in many different ways uh, and can be hidden. Um, what a criminal court of law is, it brings that to the fore. It's no longer hidden harm. Yeah. Well, this whole business of having decisions based on evidence and having you know, uh, an objective hearing, that's, yes. um, that strikes me as being just um, one of the key ways forward in so many issues environmentally. And I'm particularly sensitive to this because we in Canada have just dismissed a government that was hell-bent on getting rid of every possibility of solid evidence, yes. right? Uh, muzzling the scientists, getting rid of the long-term census, and there was a real war on knowledge going on. Yes. And that, I guess, uh, is in part because if you have knowledge, you have the possibility of, of, uh, of using a legal route or a, a route of judgment rather than, rather than a popularity. Yes. And, um, that's not something these guys wanted. Right? No, uh, but also see how fast things can change. You know, this is very exciting. Uh, your new president, Justin Trudeau, is, is really daring to be great, I suspect. You know, he's standing up and he's, he's flipping normatives very quickly. And that's very exciting because also what it demonstrates is that nothing is, is set in stone. And uh, you know, the rules of our world are laws, if you like, and laws can and do change and they can be changed very, very fast. Every country in the world can pass emergency legislation overnight. And George Bush shored up Wall Street at three o'clock in the morning, for instance, by writing new laws. And it's just a question of whether or not we could consider it now an emergency. Uh, and for many small island developing states, yes it is, absolutely. Yeah. There was a point um, back in the 1990s when Ecocide almost made it onto that very short list of international crimes. Yes. What happened there? Do we know? Well, uh, there's kind of missing gaps in our knowledge. What we do have are documents, some of, some of the documents of minutes of meetings from that time. I, it's a kind of mystery that's being pieced together bit by bit. What we do know is that Ecocide was to be the fifth international crime against peace under the Rome Statute. That was watered down. I, the word itself was taken out both as a war crime and a peace crime. And uh, even the war crime was watered down to a, a very restrictive test. We do have during wartime uh, what's known as a disjunctive test, an either or test to establish whether or not significant harm is playing out. And that's set out under the Environmental Modification Convention. Uh, the Environmental Modification Convention sets out a size duration, size or duration, or impact test. So it's a disjunctive test. But what we see during the, uh, under the Rome Statute, under Article 82B, is that that test was put in place there for environmental harm. And at the very last minute, the word or was removed and the word and was inserted instead. And what you have then is a conjunctive test, size and duration and impact. This has been um, such a high test that in fact absolutely no prosecutions have ever been brought for environmental harm during peacetime. Now, as a lawyer, I know the difference that can make that one word being removed or to and and how that closes the door to being able to do anything about it. So what I'm advocating for Ecocide is that it's put back in its rightful place, as it had been in the first place in the first drafts, it was in there. And, and, and remember this, it has been noted that over 50 countries at the time supported it. It was only four or five countries that had objected behind the scenes and had it removed without vote by the others, and many of those countries uh, objected to it being removed. And those four countries were the US, UK, uh, France and the Netherlands. 
What we do know from the records that we have is that uh, the UN rapporteurs at the time, they, they actually wrote their opinions on why this had happened and logged them into the United Nations basement and they've been discovered. And we know from them that in their opinion, it's not mine, I wasn't there, this was as a result of corporate lobbying behind the scenes by oil, uh, genetic modification and uh, nuclear interests because it would stop business as usual. Mm -hmm. So we have here a very interesting thing. Uh, here in the Netherlands, where I'm, I'm based uh, just now for the next week or so, I, there's a documentary that's just gone out about my work, and not just my work, other lawyers working in this area called An Advocate for the Earth. And this has triggered a huge amount of activity here in uh, the Dutch Parliament. Questions were asked immediately in the Parliament, why was it that the Netherlands uh, had ecocide law removed, which is really fantastic. So this should be flushing out something. And in fact, just yesterday, uh, a motion was expedited in through Parliament to demand support for ecocide law to be put forward once again. So it's triggering a whole lot of activity in a lot of different ways. Uh, here, Belgium is now picking up on it today. It's in their main newspaper. A lot of coverage in mainstream press. And of course, this is very important because The Hague is the seat of the International Criminal Court as well. And I've just been speaking there along with other lawyers and uh, the whole idea that this is really a legacy issue. You know, what is it we choose to put in place? and that there is missing crime here. There is, eco it, it, there is climate crime, if you like, missing, and that crime is ecocide. Yeah. And speaking of the Peace Palace, uh, in what context? Well, I was actually speaking at the International Criminal Court. Uh, we have the, assembly of the annual Assembly of State Parties meeting happening this week and last week. So I was speaking there just yesterday, uh, along with various others, uh, about ecocide law and how uh, the practicalities of how an amendment can be put forward and how this could move very fast. So this is in the run-up to the climate negotiations that are happening next week in Paris. And uh, the fact that there is another way, there is another legal route that can fast-track and expedite what is really required, what is necessary for those countries that are most adversely impacted by climate change. Hmm. I, I, it, it prompts me to... to uh it uh, reminds me of another sentence that I picked up in the course of my, my research into Polly Higgins. And the sentence was this. In April 2010, Polly proposed to the United Nations that an international law of ecocide be made the fifth crime against peace. And I thought to myself, Polly proposed to the United Nations. How does, how does a person get to do that? <laughs> if Donald wants to propose something to the United Nations, how does he position himself to do that? Well, I think it helps to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. Uh, as, a, as a barrister, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, I, then I have a mandate. I, I, I am able to submit a, a fully proposed legal document into the United Nations Law Commission, which is what I did. So I had the requisite mandate to be able to do that. So does that flow to any lawyer? Does any yes, lawyer actually, any lawyer can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, if I, so if I actually want to propose something to the United Nations, what I need is a partner lawyer who will go forward and do that with me or with, on my behalf, right? There, yeah. there are, there are other routes as well. It just so happened that I'm dealing with a, a proposal for a legal amendment. So as a lawyer, I can put uh, a legal amendment proposal forward. I, I mean, for instance, if you wanted to bring a case in The Hague uh, under existing law, you could, you could do that as a citizen. I, there are a number of routes in to bring a, a case in the International Criminal Court. And indeed, the first four court cases were brought by citizens, quite literally, writing to the ICC and saying, we have genocide playing out and our country is complicit in it. And uh, we want you to investigate this and bring a case. And indeed, that's, that is what has happened for the first four cases. So y it depends what, where your input is, uh, how you want to engage with what the United Nations is doing. I, I was struck by that because of the, the, the sort of the disparity between one person and this huge <laughs> international <laughs> structure. But I, I think it's a very useful reminder that the legal system actually is quite accessible, even at that level, mm. for, for uh, you know, 
even one person. Yeah, but actually, I think we often forget within society in general, we have our own mandate if we choose to create it, to speak out. I, you know, often there's this sense of disempowerment of, you know, what can I do? I can't do anything. Well, well, actually you can, you can do a heck of a lot. And even just by speaking out and saying, I refuse to engage with a system of harm, I, it's very powerful. And the more of us that do do that and say, yeah, you know, I'm calling for whatever, I'm a law of ecocide, it, it creates its own momentum. I mean, the beauty is for me is that I'm not a solo lawyer saying, there is climate crime, there is state crime, there is corporate crime. You know, Balthasar Garçon, uh, he, state prosecutor from Spain who indicted Pinochet, he's standing up and he's really calling for this in a big way. Um, in fact, Bolivia as, as, a, as a state is calling for crimes of, against the environment to, to now be recognised. You know, the Pope, uh, Archbishop Tutu are all speaking out about, about the moral duty of care and how there really should be climate liability in law. So there are many different actors in this. NGOs are ready uh, to really run with this whenever any head of state stands up and speaks out. It, we're, we're not short of um, you know, people that are already recognising that there's missing crime, and the legal community in particular. Uh, internationally are, are recognising that this is the natural next step, that it, it just gives um, weight and governance and legal teeth to all those hundreds of legal uh, environmental treaties, obligations that we already have in place and agreements that just haven't got the force of criminal law and weight behind them to become operable. It have a very widespread impact. Within the last six years a huge amount has happened uh, you know, it's not just been about writing three books about ecocide law, it's, there's been an awful lot more involved and it's, it's seeded right across the world. And I think this happens when an idea has its time, it resonates very deeply right across the world very, very fast. Yeah. Well, the idea that, that the natural world has rights, yes. uh, you know, Christopher uh, Stone was writing about that way back in the 1970s. Yes. And those of us who blundered across his work, I think we're electrified, but there weren't many of us. Yeah. yeah. But <coughs> now when you start to say the, the, the natural world should have rights, yeah. uh, there's quite a large group of people to whom this is not a totally unfamiliar idea and certainly not an unwelcome idea. And, and in fact, this is something that the indigenous world really gets, that fundamental relationship between human life and uh, the natural world is something that's understood by actually millions of people in the world, Buddhists mm. as well. Uh, so th this is not really an alien concept. And if you look at the time span that we're looking at from the 1970s, Christopher Stone, as you say, first positing that key question, do, do trees have standing, legal standing? And moving on from there, th there's been really over 40 years of legal engagement around this, if you like. So this is an idea that's very much of its you know, time and the, the kind of the, the legal weight behind it is there. The momentum for it is absolutely huge to really just take this to the next point and, and just have it put in place. So how, how far are we from doing that? Are we yeah. waiting for a state to propose this uh, mm. under the rum stamp? You know, that's a very interesting question. I mean, for me, I think we have a huge window of opportunity here, in particular with the climate negotiations. I, if the climate negotiations really fail to put anything in place that, that gives assistance where it's really required, and by that I mean to stop the dangerous industrial activity that's really triggering climate change and uh, creating the assistance that's required, a mandatory assistance for those who are most adversely impacted by by climate change, then it's a window of opportunity for those voices that are normally marginalised, such as small island states, uh, Central and South American countries such as Bolivia, to stand up and speak out and say there is another way, we are calling for climate crime and that is uh, ecocide. So I think what we're seeing is a kind of distilling and crystallising of a narrative emerging here. It's, it's a great turning point, a critical junction point where you know, the eyes of the world will be on many people in, in Paris and press agencies from around the world can hear those voices. Unlike when they, they stand on their own small island state and say, help us, we've got ecocide playing out. They're not heard, Reuters isn't there, but over 4,000 press agencies are going to be in Paris uh, in the next few weeks. 
and to stand up and say, we call for another way to be taken here. We call for this to become an international crime could be the most powerful thing of all. And for civil society to come behind this in a really big way. Uh, the grassroots movements, the, the, the indigenous communities, those voices to come together, the NGOs, uh, the faith world, uh, and the lawyers, you know. This is, this is, if you like, almost the unlikely alliances coming together and speaking out as a unified voice and calling for a very different route, route to be taken, one of climate justice, one of climate care, if you will. Yeah. But we still need a nation to say, right, <coughs> let's make this the fifth crime. And you would think that Bolivia would be a very good candidate because they'd have passed that, well, that uh, law that Mother Nature has rights. Yes. This, and they have been very brave on the international scene yes. in voting alone yeah. <coughs> against some of the compromises on the, on the climate field. Do you think they might be the ones that do it? Well, it's very interesting. I was invited over to Bolivia. They had a big conference uh, just a few months ago. I, I couldn't make it, but I was feeding into their justice, law and justice working group. I, and in fact, I was speaking to their ambassador yesterday in The Hague I, about this, and they're very keen to be seen as a voice that's looking uh, for a different way to move forward here. So I'd say watch that space. I, I, you know, I think they're going to be a big and very vocal voice uh, for an alternative way uh, to be had. Whether or not, and also whether or not it's not even through the, the ICC, uh, whether or not it's about setting up a, a, a climate uh, a crime, crime tr tribunal, uh, a regional one, maybe in Central South America, I don't know. I, but we will see. I, certainly there's a huge amount of discourse around this happening that is very much alive. And uh, the more people who stand up and speak out, the more strength it garners as it moves forward. Mm. Well, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature has already done that tribunal, as you have uh, overseen a mock trial in, uh, uh, in, in London about this. Right? Yes, on Ecoside Law, and of course in Paris a, a similar mock uh, tribunal is being set up to look at uh, nature's rights and ecocide as well. And uh, you know, to see whether or not there is evidence there to establish that there is a crime at play here. And that's, that's very good because it's not about waiting for the governments to do something about this, it's actually civil society themselves taking action and saying, okay, we're going to show how this could work in law before it's even put in place. Yeah. I wanted to come back to, to your, your sense about the, the, the potential that each of us has. Yeah. And, because you talked about internal ecocides, yes. and, and I think that's a fascinating concept. Tell me, I mean, on, on the face of it, it sounds like an oxymoron, right? An ecocide is a great big thing, internal is not such a great <laughs> big thing. <laughs> Tell me about internal ecocides. Well, it, it's my term for what I use for the patterns of harm that play out in our own lives, and our own ways of being, and how we can actually set in place cycles that take us to a, a place that does not serve our best interests. So negative belief patterns, uh, you know, I, I'm not good enough, I, who am I, I can't stand up, speak out. It closes us down, it disempowers us. These are our inner ecocides, if you like. The, these patterns of harm that, that prevent us from actually enabling us to move onwards uh, and forwards uh, and actually step into our own greatness, if you will. So I'm very interested in how we can disrupt our own inner ecocides. It's not about you know, allowing those thoughts to come to us a little less. It's about actually saying, enough, no more, I'm not having it, just as we do with ecocide law. And so this is about self-governance. How do we choose to govern our own lives? How do we choose to govern ourselves, uh, our very being? Which, of course, then is reflected out into our doing. You know, it's not an accident that we're called human beings, we're not called human doings. So it starts with the being. Who, whom do we choose? What is our belief systems? What is it within ourselves that we choose to be, which then informs whatever we choose to do? And what is it that's no longer serving our best purpose? What is it that actually prevents us from actually standing up and speaking out and daring to be great, in effect? You also made a reference earlier on to the unlikely alliance that's coming together around not just this, but I think a whole constellation of, of, uh, of issues and approaches and so forth growing out of a common, growing global consciousness. Yes. You know? 
Um, and I was struck that you mentioned the faith community because in a sense you would expect the faith community to be rather more prominent than it is in this. There are some, obviously, some many, many outstanding people that yeah. are doing a great deal in that. But the, the faith community as a whole seems to be a little harder to mobilize than the yeah. lawyers even. Right? Well, it, it, this is, I think the reason behind that is because uh, often, and not just the faith community, many mm. people <coughs> feel they do not have permission to speak out about climate change because they're not a mm. climate expert. But this isn't about knowing your science. That's for the scientists to come and give that evidence, if you like. I, I'm not a climate expert. I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer. But what I can see is that there is significant harm playing out and that actually I refuse to be complicit in that harm, so I will speak out against it. From my position as a lawyer, I can see there is missing law and that there's a legal framework required so that the scientists can c come in and give that evidence. But often I think we get trapped in this idea that it's not for us to speak out about something we don't know about. Actually, we know a lot about climate change. We see it on the news. We can see that people are being harmed. You don't have to be an expert or a rocket scientist to say this must end. And in a way, what the Pope has done, he's given permission to the faith world to start speaking out from a position of care. And indeed, that's about bringing their role as moral leaders in the world to say there is a moral duty of care here. Absolutely right, that has to be heard from the faith community. Mm -hmm. And I was very excited to hear and see the Pope mobilizing uh, for that. And indeed, I, I was in Paris uh, just a few months ago uh, where President Hollande had brought together faith leaders of the world to speak about that moral duty of care for climate issues. So there's very much a heightened awareness now. And I think what's happening here is giving other faith leaders permission to stand up and speak about this and recognize that they do not need to be some climate expert or scientist to be able to say, this is wrong, enough, no more. We owe uh, a moral and therefore legal duty of care to protect our earth. And if they don't, if they aren't experts on moral matters, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all are, in <laughs> truth. And you don't need to be an expert on that. No, right. I mean, this is, this is actually quite simple stuff. Ask a child, uh, you know, whether or not, do you think it's right that we destroy the world? You know, most, most children will turn around and say no. <laughs> do you think it's for the best that we do something, that we put the people on planet first? Yes. You know, this is not rocket science. This is quite simple stuff. And indeed, uh, you know, I sometimes get contacted by kids who say, this is right, thank goodness you're an adult speaking sense on this. So I'm a lawyer and I've got a kid telling me this, <laughs> you know, and that's good. You know, obviously my message is being heard and I think this is true of universal truths. They are inherently simple, you know, uh, they needn't be complicated. It's just lawyers that make things complicated <laughs> you know and once you pare it down to uh, distill it to what, what is it that we're really addressing here what is climate justice what is climate care I uh, what is it that it really comes down to it's about a duty of care it's about our responsibilities to the collective we have a common and joint responsibility here uh, this is a global commons issue is there an internal ecocide that has to do with um, with what, th with the number that specialization has done to our ways of thinking about ourselves. Uh, and what I'm thinking about is, for example, somebody saying with, I think with relation to the Orenda case here in the, in the Netherlands, yes. what does a judge know about climate change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to which my response would be, well, a judge knows how to evaluate evidence, and that's really what's required in this, in this case, and, you know, it's up to others to bring the evidence. But there's this sense, <coughs> I think, in a lot of us, that if we don't have some kind of specialized knowledge, we're disqualified from speaking. And well, that is your yeah. internal ecocide, isn't it? Yeah, but actually, absolutely right. And in fact, it's kind of missing the point of what happened with the Urgenda case here in, in the Netherlands. What the judge was doing there was that he was proclaiming that there is a state legal duty uh, to ensure that harm does not occur. And yes, he doesn't have to be the expert on that, but he has heard evidence from the experts and he is satisfied so that he, he is sure uh, that there is missing duty here. So this is about state responsibility. Interestingly, we've just discovered that when ecocide was removed from the Rome Statute back in 1996, 
I, at the same time, there was a d drafting of another document for state crimes. So it was, it was stating what the state responsibilities were. And that document had ecocide as a, as a crime against the state in it. And it was removed at the same time as it was removed from the Rome Statute. So it was removed as a crime against peace and it was removed as a state crime. Now, this is really the missing gaps in our knowledge. How come that happened at the same time? What was going on there? We don't really know, but it was removed at both sides. And, and we actually do have very limited uh, state crime uh, actually documented now. We do have a document that states what state crime is. But it, what is absent from it is any form of responsibility for uh, people and planet, if you like, for environmental uh, issues, uh, for climate issues. So all this judge is doing is actually giving voice to something that hasn't been put down in paper form. And quite rightly, I mean, it's common sense at the end of the day. He's saying th the state who represents civil society at large has uh, a common and joint responsibility for the citizens and for the citizens of the world as well. It's not mm. just a sovereign uh, duty. It's one that's a global duty as well. It's a terribly moving case. Right? Well, it's very exciting. It's being appealed by the government. And uh, of course, this is about the wisdom of the rule of law. Uh, at the end of the day. So it will be very interesting to see whether or not this is uh, substantiated. And of course, it's just been announced here in the Netherlands just yesterday that they're now putting in place, uh, well, calling for a climate act. And what is so truly radical is that there's a coalition government of, for the first time in 35 years, uh, members of uh, opposing uh, political parties have come together to call for this climate act which of course creates even more leverage and support for the judiciary saying yes and there is a missing duty of care here. There is an implied term, an implied duty of care, legal duty of care that now needs to be put in place through law. Yeah. We're, we're living in a scary period but when we have a conversation like this we're living in a tremendously exciting period. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And it's not about allowing the fear to close us down uh, and get stuck in uh, negative thought pa patterns on this. I mean, I was hearing this uh, just yesterday, how, uh, you know, it's not possible, we can't do this, we've got too much work, you know, uh, we're, uh, getting ecocide law in place will be too much to do. Well, actually, this is a legacy issue. You know, we mm -hmm. make the space, we make it happen. You know, this is about saving lives, this is about ensuring the health and well-being of our very planet and future generations in a very big way. You know, it's not about allowing the ticking time bombs to keep on exploding as we move forward. It's about actually dismantling and stopping the ticking time bombs here and now. And if you don't have time for that, what do you have time for? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you just make the time. I mean, I decided to take a year off from being a court advocate to work this out. And as a court advocate, my tools and my trade are laws, and I can see there are missing laws, and I know how a law plays out. I also know how fast uh, law can be put in place. Every country in the world can pass emergency laws overnight. We can make the time for this. Polly Higgins, attorney for the planet, advocate for an anti-ecocide law, and a leading figure in an emerging global brigade of Earth lawyers. If you enjoyed this interview, you may want to look at our interviews with other green lawyers. David Boyd, Roger Cox, Cormac Cullinan, Pablo Fiardo, and Antonio Oposa, Jr., just for starters. Right now, the field of earth law is one of the most exciting domains in the entire environmental movement, as you've seen in this conversation with Polly Higgins. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you again next time.